from the Cube Studios in Palo Alto and Boston, bringing you data-driven insights from the Cube and ETR. This is Breaking Analysis with Dave Vellante. The introduction and socialization of data mesh has caused practitioners, business technology executives, and technologists to pause and ask some probing questions about the organization of their data teams, their data strategies, future investments, and their current architectural approaches. Some in the technology community have embraced the concept, others have twisted the definition, while still others remain oblivious to the momentum building around data mesh. You know, we are in the early days of data mesh adoption. Organizations that have taken the plunge will tell you that aligning stakeholders is a non-trivial effort, but necessary to break through the limitations that monolithic data architectures and highly specialized teams have imposed over frustrated business and domain leaders. However, practical data mesh examples often lie in the eyes of the implementer and may not strictly adhere to the principles of data mesh. Now, part of the problem is lack of open technologies and standards that can accelerate adoption and reduce friction. And that's what we're going to talk about today. Some of the key technology and architecture questions around data mesh. Hello and welcome to this week's Wikibon Cube Insights powered by ETR. And in this breaking analysis, we welcome back the founder of Data Mesh and Director of Emerging Technologies at ThoughtWorks, Jamak Dagani. Hello, Jamak. Thanks for being here today. Hi, Dave. Thank you for having me back. It's always a delight to connect and have a conversation. Great, Thank you. looking forward to it. Okay, so before we get into it and the technology details, I just want to quickly share some data from our friends at ETR. You know, despite the importance of data initiatives since the pandemic, CIOs and IT organizations have had to juggle, of course, a few other priorities. This is why in the survey data, cyber and cloud computing are rated as the two most important priorities, analytics and machine learning and AI, which are kind of data topics, still make the top of the list well ahead of many other categories. And look, a sound data architecture and strategy is fundamental to digital transformations. And much of the past two years, as we've often said, has been like a forced march into digital. So while organizations are moving forward, they really have to think hard about the data architecture decisions that they make because they're going to, it's going to impact them, Jamak, for years to come, isn't it? Yes, absolutely. I mean, we are moving really from, slowly moving from reason-based algorithmic, logical algorithmic to model-based um, computation and decision-making uh, where we exploit the patterns and signals within the data. So data becomes a very important ingredient of uh, not only decision-making and analytics and discovering trends, but also the features and applications that we build for features. So we can't really ignore it. And, and as we see, uh, you know, some of the existing challenges around getting value from data is not necessarily that no longer is, is access to computation, it's actually access to trustworthy, you know, reliable data at scale. Yeah, and you see these domains coming together with, with, with cloud and obviously it has to be secure and trusted and, and that's why we're here today talking about a data mesh, so let's get into it. Jamak, first, your new book is out, Data Mesh, Delivering Data-Driven Value at Scale, just recently published, so congratulations on, on getting that done, awesome. Um, now, in a recent presentation, you pulled excerpts from the book, and we're going to talk through some of the technology and architectural considerations. Just quickly for the audience, four principles of data mesh, domain-driven ownership, uh, data as product, self-serve data platform, and federated computational government governance. So I want to start with self-serve platform and some of the data that you shared recently. You say that data mesh serves autonomous domain-oriented teams versus existing platforms, which serve a centralized team. C can you elaborate? Sure. I mean, the role of the platform is to lower the cognitive load for domain teams, for people who are focusing on the business outcomes, the technologies that are building the applications, to really lower the cognitive load for them to be able to work with data, whether they are building analytics, um, automated decision-making, um, intelligent mod modeling, uh, th they need to be able to get access to data and use it. So the role of the platform, I guess, just stepping back for a moment, is to empower and enable these teams. Uh, data mesh, by definition, is a scale-out model, is a decentralized model that wants to give autonomy to cross-functional teams. Um, so at, 
at its core requires a set of tools uh, that work really well in that decentralized model. Uh, when we look at the existing platforms, they, they, they try to achieve the similar outcome, right? Lower the cognitive load, give the tools to data practitioners uh, to manage data at scale. Because today, centralized teams, they're really their job, the centralized data teams, their job isn't really directly aligned with a one or two or different you know, business units and business outcomes in terms of getting value from data. Their job is manage the data and make the data available for then those cross-functional teams or business units to use the data. So the platforms they've been given are really centralized around or tuned to work with this, this is structure of the team, um, structure of centralized team. Uh, and I, although on the surface it seems that why, why not, why can't I use my you know, cloud storage or computation or data warehouse in a decentralized way, uh, you should be able to, but you still some changes need to happen to those underlying platforms. As an example, some cloud providers simply have hard limits on the number of like account storage storage accounts that you can have because they never envisage you have hundreds of lakes they envisage one or two maybe 10 lakes right uh, they envisage really centralizing data not decentralizing data so so i think we see a shift in uh, thinking about enabling autonomous independent teams versus a centralized um, team so just to follow up, if I may, we could be here for a while, but so this assumes that you've sorted out the organizational considerations, that you've defined all the, all the what a data product is and a, and a, and a sub product. And people will say, you know, cause we use the term monolithic as a pejorative, let's face it. Uh, but the, the, the data warehouse crowd would say, well, that's what data March did. You know, we, so we got that, that covered, but you're, the premise of data mesh, if I understand it, is whether it's a data marsh or a data a data mart or a data warehouse or a data lake or, or whatever, uh, it, a snowflake warehouse, it's a node on the mesh. Okay, so don't build your organization around the technology. Let the technology serve the organization. Is that that's a perfect way of putting it? Exactly. I mean, for a very long time, when we look at decomposition of complexity, we've looked at decomposition of complexity around technology, right? So we have technology, and that's a maybe good segue to actually the next um, item on that list that we looked at, oh, I need to you know, decompose based on whether I want to have access to raw data, put it on the lake, or whether I want to have access to model data and put it on the warehouse, whether you know, I need to have a team in the, in, in the middle to move the data around so uh, the, and then you know try to fit the organization into that model so data mesh really uh, inverses that and as you said is look at the organizational structure first um, the scale boundaries around which your organization and operation can scale and then the second layer look at the technology and how you decompose it Okay, so let's go to that next point and talk about how you, know, how you serve and manage a, a, autonomous inter, interoperable data products where code data policy you say is treated as one unit, whereas your contention is existing platforms of course have independent management and dashboards for catalogs or storage, et cetera. Maybe be double click on that a bit. Yeah, so if you think about um, that functional or technical decomposition, right, of concerns. That's one way, that's a very valid way of decomposing complexity and concerns, and then build, build solutions, independent solutions to address them. Uh, that's what we see in the technology landscape today. We will see technologies that are taking care of your management of data, bring your data under some sort of a control and modeling. You will see technology that uh, moves that data around or perform various transformations and computations on it. And then you see technology that tries to overlay uh, some level of meaning, metadata, understandability, discoverability, and policy, right? So that's where your um, data processing kind of pipeline technologies versus data um, warehouse storage lake technologies and then the governance come to play. And over time we, we decompose and recompose, right? Deconstruct and reconstruct back this together. But, but right now that's where we stand. Uh, I think for data mesh really to become a reality, as in 
independent sources of data and teams can responsibly share data in a way that can be understood right then and there, can impose policies right then when the data gets accessed in that source, um, and in a, in a resilient manner, like in a, in a way that data um, changes to the, con the structure of the data or changes to the scheme of the data doesn't have those downstream um, downtimes, uh, we've got to think about this new nucleus or new, um, you know, units of data sharing, and we need to really bring that transformation um, and governing data and the data itself together around these decentralized nodes on the mesh. So uh, that's another, I, I guess, deconstruction and reconstruction that needs to happen around the technology to formulate ourselves around the domains. And again, the data and the logic of the data itself, the meaning of the data itself. Great, got it. And we're going to talk more about the, the importance of data sharing and the implications. But the third point uh, deals with how operational and analytical technologies are constructed. You've got an app, app dev stack, you've got a data stack. You've made the point many times actually that, that we've contextualized our operational systems, but not uh, you know, our, our, our data systems. They, they remain separate. Um, maybe you could elaborate on this point. Yes, I think this is again has a historical background and beginning. You know, for um, a really long time, applications have dealt with features and you know the logic of running the business and and encapsulating the data and the state that they need to run that feature or run that business function. And then we had for anything analytical driven, which required access data across these applications and across the longer dimension of time around different you know, subjects within the organization, this analytical data, we had made a decision that, okay, let, let's leave those applications aside, let's leave those databases aside, we will extract the data out and we will load it or we'll transform it and put it under the analytical kind of data stack and then downstream from it, we will have analytical data users, the data analysts, the data scientists, and the, you know, the portfolio of users that are growing mm -hmm. use that data stack. And that led to this really separation of dual stack with point-to-point -point integration. So applications went down the path of transactional databases or urban document store, but, but using APIs for communicating. And then we've gone to you know, lake storage or, or, or data warehouse on the other side. Um, if we are moving, and that, you know, that again, enforces the silo of data versus app, right? Uh, so if we are moving to the world that the, our missions that are ambitious around, ambitions around um, making applications more intelligent, making them data-driven, these two worlds need to come closer as in ML analytics gets embedded into those applications themselves. And, and the data sharing as a in, very essential ingredient of that gets embedded and gets closer, becomes closer to those applications. So, so if you are looking at this now cross-functional app data biz team, right, business team, then um, the technology stack, stacks can't be so segregated, right? It has to be a continuum of experience from app delivery to sharing of the data, to using that data to embed models back into those applications. And that, that continuum of experience requires well-integrated uh, technologies. I'll give you an example, um, which actually is in some sense, we are somewhat moving to that direction. But if we are talking about data sharing or data modeling and applications use you know, one set of APIs, you know, HTTP compliant, GraphQL or REST APIs. And on the other hand, you have proprietary SQL, like connect to my database and run SQL. Like those are, those are very two different models of representing and accessing data. So we kind of have to harmonize or integrate those two worlds a bit more closely to achieve that domain-oriented cross-functional um, you know, teams. Yeah, we're going to talk about some of the gaps later and how there are actually you look at them as opportunities, you know, more than barriers, but they are, they are barriers, but they're they're opportunities for more innovation. Let's go on to the fourth one, the next point. It deals with the roles uh, that the platform serves. A data mesh proposes that domain experts own the data and take responsibility for it end to end and are served by the technology. You kind of we referenced that before. Whereas your contention is that today data systems 
are really designed for specialists. I think you use the term hyper-specialists a lot. I love that term. And the generalists are as kind of passive bystanders waiting in line for the technical teams to serve them. Yes, I mean, uh, if you think about the, again, the intention behind Data Mesh was creating a responsible data sharing model that scales out. And, and I challenge any organization that has a scaled ambitions around data or usage of data that relies on small pockets of very expensive specialist resources, right? So we, we have no choice but upskilling, cross-skilling the majority population of our technologists. Um, we often call them generalists, right? That's a shorthand for um, people that can really uh, move from one domain to a, one technology to another technology and, you know, paint some, sometimes we call them paint drip people, sometimes we call them T-shaped people. But regardless, like we need to have ability to really mobilize um, our generalists. And, and we had to do that at ThoughtWorks. We serve a lot of our clients and like many other organizations, we are also challenged with hiring specialists. So uh, we, we have tested the model of having a few specialists really conveying and translating the knowledge to generalists and bring them forward. And of course, platform is a, is a big enabler of that. Like what, what, are, what is the language of using the technology? What are the APIs that delight that generalist experience? And it doesn't, this doesn't mean no code, low code, we have to throw away into good engineering practices. And I think good software engineering practices remain to exist. Of course, they get adopted to the world of data to, to build resilient and you know, sustainable solutions, but um, specialty, especially around kind of proprietary technology is, is going to be a hard one to scale. Okay, I, I'm definitely going to come back and, and, and pick your brain on that one. Um, and you know, your point about scale out in the, in the examples, the practical examples of companies that have implemented data mesh that I've talked to, I think in all cases, you know, there's only a handful that I've really gone deep with, but it was their, their Hadoop instances, their clusters wouldn't scale, they couldn't scale the business around it. So that's a, really a, a key, key point. It was a, a common pattern that, that we've seen. Now, I think in all cases, they, <laughs> You know, they went to like a data lake model in AWS. And so that maybe has some you know, violation of the principles, but we'll come back to that. But so let me, let me go on to the next one. Of course, data mesh leans heavily toward this concept of decentralization to support domain ownership over the centralized approaches. And we certainly see this, the public cloud players, database companies as key actors here with very large install bases pushing a centralized approach. So I guess my question is, you know, how realistic is, is this, this, this next point where you have decentralized technologies ruling the roost? I think uh, if you look at the history of places in, in our industry where decentralization has succeeded, they heavily relied on um, standardization of connectivity with, you know, across different components of technology. And I think um, right now you're right. Um, the, the way we get value from data relies on collection at the end of the day, collection of data, whether you have a deep learning machine, machine learning machine, <laughs> uh, machine learning model that you're training or you have, you know, reports to generate. Regardless, the, the model is bring your data to a place that you can collect it so that you can use it. And that leads to a naturally set of technologies that try to operate as a full stack integrated proprietary with no intention of you know, opening data for, for sharing. Um, if you now, conversely, if you think about internet itself, web itself, microservices even at the enterprise level, not at the planetary level, um, they succeeded as decentralized technologies to a large degree uh, because of their emphasis on openness and, openness and sharing, right? API sharing. We, we don't talk about in the API worlds, like we don't say, you know, I will build a platform to manage your logic or applications, maybe to, to a degree, but actually moved away from that. We say, I will build a platform that opens our applications to manage your APIs, manage your interfaces, right? Give you access to API. So I think I think the shift needs to that that definition of decentralized there means really composable, open pieces of the technology that can play nicely with each other, rather than a full stack, all have control of your data 
um, yet being somewhat decentralized within the boundary of my platform, um, you know, that, that's, that's just simply not going to scale if, if data needs to come from different platforms, different locations, different geographical locations. It's, um, it needs a re rethink. Okay, thank you. And then the, the, the final point is, is data mesh favors technologies that are domain agnostic versus those that are domain aware. And I wonder if you could help me square the circle because it's nuanced uh, and I'm kind of a 100 level student of, of your work, but you have said, for example, that you know, the data teams lack context of the domain. And so help, help us understand what you mean here uh, in this, in this sure. case. Absolutely, so as, as you said, we want to, Take, data mesh tries to give autonomy and decision-making power and um, responsibility to people that have the context of those domains, right? The people that are really familiar with different business domains and naturally the data that that domains needs or that naturally the domain data that domains shares. Uh, so if we if the intention of the platform is really to giving give the power to people with most relevant and timely context, the flat platform itself naturally becomes, as a shared component, becomes domain agnostic to a large degree. Of course, those domains can still, platform is a <laughs> fairly overloaded world, as in if you think about it as a set of technology that abstracts complexity and allows building the next level solutions on top, those domains may have their own set of platforms that are very much domain agnostic. But as a generalized shareable set of technologies or tools that allows us um, share share data, so that, that, that piece of technology um, needs to relinquish uh, the knowledge of the context to the domain teams and actually becomes domain agnostic. Got it, okay, makes sense. All right, let's shift gears here, talk about some of the gaps and some of the, the standards that are needed. You and I have talked about this a little bit before, but this digs deeper. What types of standards, standards are needed? Maybe you could walk us through this graphic, please. Sure. So what I'm trying to depict here is that if we uh, if we imagine a world that data can be shared from many different locations for a variety of analytical use cases, um, naturally the boundary of what we call a node on the mesh will encapsulate internally a fair few pieces. It's not just the boundary of that you know node on the mesh. Uh, is, is the data itself that it's controlling and updating and maintaining. It's, the, of course, the computation and the code that's responsible for that data. And then the, the policies that continue to govern that data as long as that data exists. So if that's the boundary, then if we shift that focus from uh, implementation of implementation details that we can leave that for later, what becomes really important is the, is the scene are the APIs and interfaces that this node exposes. And I think that's where um, the work that needs to be done um, and, and the standards that are missing. And, and we want the seam and those interfaces be open because that allows you know, different organizations with different boundaries of trust to share data, not only to share data to kind of move that data to yet another location, to share data in a way that distributed workloads, distributed analytics, distributed machine learning model can happen on the data where it is. So if you follow that line of thinking around the centralization and connection of data versus collection of data, I think the very, very important piece of it that needs really deep thinking, and I, I don't claim that I have done that, is how do we share data responsibly and sustainably, right? That it's not brittle. Um, if you think about it today, the ways we share data, one, one of the very common ways is around, I'll give you a JDC endpoint or I'll give you an endpoint to your you know, database of choice. And now I, as, as a technology or as a user, actually, you can now have access to the schema of the underlying data and then run various queries or SQL queries on it. That's very simple and easy to get started with. That's why SQL is an evergreen you know, standard or semi-standard, pseudo-standard that we all use. But it's also very brittle because um, we are dependent on a underlying schema and formatting of the data that's been designed to tell the computer how to store and manage the data. Um, so I think that the data sharing APIs of the future really need to think about removing these brittle dependencies, think about 
sharing not only the data, but what we call metadata, I suppose, uh, additional set of characteristics that is always shared along with data to make the data usage, I suppose, ethical um, and, 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 and also friendly for the users. Um, and also, you know, it, I think we have to, that data sharing API, the other element of it is to allow kind of computation to run where the data exists. Uh, so if you think about SQL again as a simple primitive example of computation, when we select and when we filter and when we join, the computation is happening on that data. So maybe there is a next level of articulating distributed computation on data that simply trains models, right? Your, your, your language primitives change in a way to allow sophisticated analytical workloads run on the data more responsibly with you know, policies and access control enforced. So I think that output port that I mentioned simply um, is about you know, next generation data sharing, responsible data sharing APIs suitable for analytical, decentralized analytical workloads. So, uh, okay, so I'm not trying to bait you here, but I, I have a follow-up as well. So you, you, schema for, for all it's good creates constraints. No schema on write, well that didn't work because it was just a free for all and it created you know, the, the yeah. data, data swamps. But that, now you have you know, technology companies trying to solve that problem. Take Snowflake for, for example, you know, enabling you know, data sharing, but it is within its proprietary environment. Uh, certainly Databricks do, doing something, you know, trying to come at it from, from its angle, um, bringing some of the best of data warehouse with, with the data, data science. Um, is your contention that those remain sort of proprietary and, and, and de facto standards and then what we need is more open standards? Uh, maybe you could comment. Sure. I think the contention, the two points, one is as you mentioned, open standards that allow, um, you know, actually make the underlying platform invisible. I mean, my litmus test for a technology provider to say, I'm a data mesh, you know, <laughs> kind of compliant uh, is, is your platform invisible? As in, can I replace it with another and yet get the similar data sharing experience that I need? Um, so part of it is that. Part of it is open standards, so they're not really proprietary. Uh, the other angle for kind of sharing data across um, different platforms so that, you know, uh, we don't we don't get it stuck with one technology or another um, is around what what you know is around apis it is around code that is protecting that internal schema so where we are on the curve of evolution of technology right now we have we are exposing the internal structure of the data that is designed to optimize certain modes of access we're exposing that to the end client and application APIs, right? So the APIs that use the data today are very much aware that this database was optimized for machine learning workloads, hence you will deal with a columnar storage of the file, versus this other API is optimized for a very different, um, you know, report type access, relational access, and is optimized around rows. I think that is, that should become irrelevant in the API sharing of the future because as a user, I shouldn't care how this data is internally optimized, right? My, the, the language primitive that, that I'm using should be really agnostic to the machine optimization underneath that. And, and if it did that, perhaps this war between you know, warehouse or lake or the other will become actually irrelevant. Um, so we are optimizing for that human, best human experience as opposed to the best machine experience, we still have to do that, but we have to make that invisible, make that an implementation concern. So um, that's another angle of what the, what what should, if we, if we daydream together, the best experience and resilient experience in terms of data usage, then these APIs become agnostic to the internal storage structure. Great, thank you for that. Uh, we've, we've, we've up to our ankles now in the controversy, so we might as well wade all the way in. I can't let you go without addressing some of this which you've catalyzed, which I, by the way, I see as a sign of progress. So this gentleman, Paul Andrew, is an architect and he gave a presentation, I think last night, and he teased it as, quote, the theory from Jamak Dagani versus the practical experience of a technical architect, AKA me, meaning him. And Jamak, you were quick to shoot back that data mesh is not theory, it's based on practice and some practices are experimental, some are more 
baked and, and data mesh really avoids by design specific, the specificity of vendor or, or technology. And then you, you say perhaps you intend to frame your post as a technology or vendor specific, specific implementation. So, so, so touche, you, you, that was excellent. <laughs> now, you don't need me to defend you, but I, but I will anyway. You spent 14 plus years as a software engineer and the better part of a decade consulting with some of the most technically advanced companies in the world. But I'm going to push you a little bit here and say, you know, some of this tension is of your own making because you purposefully don't talk about technologies and, and vendors. Sometimes doing so, it's instructive uh, for us neophytes. So why don't you ever like use specific examples of technology for frames of reference? Yes. My role is push us to the next level. So, you know, everybody picks their fights, pick their battles. Um, you know, my, my, my role in this battle is to push us to think beyond what's available today. Of course, that's my public persona. But on a day-to-day -day basis, actually, I work with clients and existing technology. And, and I think at Towers, we have given the talk. We gave a case study talk with a colleague of mine, and I intentionally get, got him to talk about, Sina you know, Jahan, to talk about the technology that we use to implement data mesh. Um, and the reason I haven't really embraced in my conversations, um, you know, that this specific technology, one is I feel the technology solutions we're using today are still not ready for the vision. I mean, we have to be in this transitional step, no matter what, we have to be pragmatic, of course, and practical, I suppose, and, and use the existing vendors that exist. And I wholeheartedly embrace that, but that's just not my role um, you know, to, to show that. I, I've gone through this transformation once before in my life. You know, when, when microservices happened, uh, we were building microservices like architectures with technology that wasn't ready for it. Big application, web application servers that were designed to run these giant monolithic applications. And now we were trying to run little microservices onto them. And the, the tail was wagging the dog. The environmental complexity of running these services was so consuming so much of our effort that we couldn't really pay attention to that business logic, the business value. And that's where we are today. The complexity of integrating existing technologies really overwhelmingly um, you know, capturing a lot of our attention and cost and effort, money and effort to, as opposed to really focusing on the data product themselves. So it's just, that's, that's the role I have, but it doesn't mean that, um, you know, we have to rebuild the world. We, we've, we've got to do with what we have in this transitional phase until the new generation, I guess, um, technologies come around and reshape our landscape of tools. Well, impressive public discipline. Your point about microservices is interesting because a lot of those early microservices weren't so micro. And for, you know, for the naysayers, look, past is not prologue, but, but ThoughtWorks was really early on in the whole concept of microservices. So um, be very excited to see how this plays out. But now there were some other good comments. Uh, there was one from a, a gentleman who said, the most interesting aspects of data mesh, data mesh are organizational. And that's how my colleague Sanjeev Mohan frames data mesh versus data fabric. You know, I'm not sure, I think, We've sort of scratched the surface today that, that data today, the data mesh is more. And I still think data fabric is what NetApp defined as software defined storage infrastructure that can serve on-prem and public cloud workloads, you know, back whatever, 2016. But the point you make in the thread that we're showing you here is that you're warning that the, and you referenced this earlier, that the segregating different modes of access will lead to fragmentation and we don't want to repeat the mistakes of the past. Yes, there are comments around, um, you know, I, again, going back to that original conversation that, you know, we have got this at a, at a macro level, we've got this tendency to decompose complexity based on technical solutions. Um, and, you know, the conversation could be, Oh, I, I do batch or you do a stream and we are different. You know, we, we create these bifurcations in our, in our decisions based on the technology or I do events and you do tables, right? Uh, so that, that sort of segregation of modes of access causes accidental complexity that we keep dealing with because every time in this tree, you create a new branch, uh, you create new, you know, 
kind of new set of tools that then it somehow need to be point to point integrated. You create new specialization around that. So the least number of branches that we have, I think, the, the, and, and think about really um, about the continuum of experiences that we need to create and technologies that simplify that continuum of experience. So one of the things, for example, give you a past experience. Um, I was really excited around uh, the papers and the work that came around on Apache Beam uh, and generally, you know, flow-based programming and stream processing, because basically they were saying whether you were doing batch or whether you're doing streaming, it's all one stream. And sometimes the window of time, you know, narrows and sometimes the window of time over which you're computing, um, you know, widens. And at the end of the day, it's you're just getting, you know, doing the stream processing. So it's those sort of notions that simplify and create a continuum of experience, um, I think resonate with me personally more than creating these tribal fights of this type versus that mode of access. So that's why data mesh by um, naturally selects kind of this multimodal access to, uh, to support the end users, right? The persona of the end users. Okay, so the last topic I want to hit is, look at this, this whole discussion that the topic of data mesh, it's highly nuanced, it's new, and people are going to shoehorn data mesh into their respective views of, of the world. And, we talked about you know, lake houses and S3 buckets, and of course the gentleman from LinkedIn with, with Azure. Microsoft has a data mesh community. Um, so you're, you're going to have to enlist some serious army of enforcers to adjudicate. But 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 and I and I just wrote some of the stuff down. I mean, it's interesting. Monte Carlo has a data mesh calculator. Starburst is leaning in. Chaos Search sees themselves as an enabler. O Oracle and Snowflake both use the term data mesh. And then of course you got big. Practitioners, JPMC, we've talked to, Intuit, Zalando, HelloFresh has been on, Netflix has this event-based sort of streaming implementation. So my question is how realistic is it that the clarity of your vision can be implemented and not polluted by, by really rich technology companies and others? <laughs> is it even possible, right? <laughs> is it even possible? That's, uh... Yes, that's why I practice Zen these days. I should practice Zen yeah. these days because I think uh, I think that's that's it's it's going to be hard. I think the what I'm hopeful is that the socio technical labeling data mesh that this is a socio technical concern or solution, not just a technology solution. Hopefully, always brings us back to. Um, you know, the reality that the vendors try to, you know, sell you snake oil that, you know, solves all of your problems, uh, all of your data mesh problems. It's just, um, it's just going to cause more problem down the track. So we will see, time will tell, um, Dave, and I, I count on you as one of those <laughs> members of, you know, folks that will uh, continue to share their platform um, to, to go back to the root of why, why in the first place? I mean, I dedicated a whole part of the book to why, because we get, as you said, we get carried away with vendors and technology solution, try to ride the wave. And in, in that story, we forget the reason for which we even making this change and we're going to spend all of these resources. Um, so hopefully we can always come back to that. Yeah, and I think we can. I think, you know, you have really given this some deep thought and as we pointed out, you know, the, this was based on practical knowledge um, and experience and Look, we've been trying to solve this data problem for, for a long, long time. You've not only articulated it well, but you've come up with solutions. So Jamak, thank you so much. We're going to leave it there and, uh, and love to have you back. Thank you for the conversation. I really enjoyed it. And thank you for sharing your platform to talk about data mesh. Yeah, you bet. All right, and I want to thank my colleague, Stephanie Chan, who helps research topics for us. Alex Meyerson is on production and Kristen Martin, Cheryl Knight and Rob Hof on editorial. Remember, all these episodes, they're available as podcasts. Wherever you listen, all you got to do is search Breaking Analysis Podcast. Check out ETR's website at etr.ai for all the data. And we publish a full report every week on wikibon.com and siliconangle.com. You can reach me by email, david.vellante at siliconangle.com or DM me at dvellante. Hit us up on our LinkedIn post. This is Dave Vellante for theCUBE Insights, powered by ETR. Have a great week, stay safe, be well, and we'll see you next time.